خب برنامه کاری درسی شد من یوسف مصدقی هستم دیشب در ادامه کورسی که ما داشتیم درباره انقلاب ایران و ریشه های ایجاد و استقرارش مهمان خیلی گرامی و عرجمندی داشتیم آقای دکتر مهران ایشون با توجه به نقشی که داشتن در اقتصاد دوره پهلوی به نظرم تونستن یه شمای کلی از شرایط بدن و فکر میکنم که کتاب ایشون هم در این موضوع در مورد در شکلی بانک مرکز و سیاست های اقتصادیش کتاب خیلی راه بشایه برای کسانی که بخوان ابعاد اقتصادی در واقع انقلاب ایران رو و ریشه های شکلی انقلاب ایران رو به خوبی درک کنن البته یه نگاه معینی ایشون دارن که ممکنه قابل نقد هم باشه اما دانش گسترده ایشون در این موضوع خیلی میتونه روشنگر باشه If you go back a little back, he was a Pahlavi, leaning to Pahlavi, an early Dari. There's a lot of world which is actually has an absolutely precise um, definition for the world. It makes a very different اسمم مهدی گنجوی و الان از یک سال و اندیه که به جلسه روز جمعه در واقع گروه ایرانیان استادیز دانشگاه تورنتو میام و برام فرصت خوبیه برای اینکه با روش های مدرن و متود های جدید علوم انسانی برای بررسی علمی تاریخ ایران آشنا بشم من فروش دباق هستم از به دپارتمان هیستوریکال استادیز دپارتمن سال سوم پوستارتا فروشیپ که در دپارتمان هیستوریکال استادیز مشغول به کار و پژوهشم توفیق دارم که در این مدت با دکتر توکلی هم همکار بوده ایم و خدمتشون در NMC و Iranian Studies Initiative Iranian Studies رسیده ایم در کسیر از این جلسات شرکت کرده هم یک نوبت هم خودم سخندانی کردم امروز هم آمدم تا از سخندانی خوبی که به وسیله رئیس اسبق بانک ملی ایران قرار است انجام شود استفاده کنم در مجموع از این که در این دو سال و نیم با همکاران و دوستان متعددی در NMC آشنا شده هم حقیقتا خورسندم بسیار خوشحالیم که جناب آقای دکتر توکلی این برنامه هفته هفتگی رو به طور مرتب اجرا میکنن و من این افتخار رو داشتم که چند دفعه در خدمتشون بودم امروز هم خیلی واقعا فرصت مناسبی بود برای اینکه آقای مهران رو ببینیم از نزدیک من حقیقت فکر نمی کردم اصلا سن و سنشون در این حدش میگم خیلی سن بیشتر از این داشت اصلا نمی دونستم هنوز دقیقه ده حیات باشم ولی مشاهده خیلی جوان هستن و خیلی هم سرحال هستن و خیلی خوشحالم که میتونیم به سخنشون بریم و در خدمتشون باشیم 
So as chair of the Department of Near Middle Eastern Civilizations, I'm really happy to be able to um, draw attention to the fact that uh, this um, seminar series that Professor Mohammed Tabakoli has been leading, which is a uh, falls under the umbrella of one of our initiatives, the Running Studies Initiative, has been going on for some years now, and it's uh, as you can see thriving with a lot of student participation, faculty participation, and we're very excited about the event this evening um, with uh, pr uh, Professor Hassan Ali Medran giving a lecture on some of the research that he's done in recent years. This year we have had a number of really exceptional guests and tonight is one of those. It is a great honor for me to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mr. Hassan Ali Mehran. Mr. Mehran is, a visiting, is visiting the University of Toronto on the occasion of the publication of his new released book, The Goals and Policies of the Central Bank of Iran, 1960-1978. This is an authoritative book for Mr. Mehran had himself served as the governor of the Iranian Central Bank between 1975 to 1978. To illustrate Mr. Mehran's distinction, I cannot resist noting that all denomination of Iranian banknotes printed during this period bear his signature and that and these are the bills that you see uh, on, the, on the poster and the signature uh, here. Uh, a few samples as I noted appear on the poster and uh, I had the privilege of getting him reauthorized uh, a few of those bills. Like many of you here, Mr. Mehran was an academic in the earlier part of his career, a graduate of the University of Nottingham and Johns Hopkins University. Mr. Mehran was a lecturer in economics at the University of Bristol before joining the International Monetary Fund in 1968. He left the IMF in 1969 to move to the command center of the Iranian economy during an exceptional period of economic growth, a period that came to closure with the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Prior to the 1979 Revolution, Mr. Mehran served as Vice Minister of Economy, Deputy Minister of Economic Affairs and Finance, Governor of the Central Bank, Deputy Chairman and Managing Director of the National Iranian Oil Company, Minister of Budget and Planning, and Minister of Economic Affairs and Finance. Immediately after the 1979 revolution, Mr. Mehran rejoined the IMF. In 1986, he was assigned to establish the Cent established the Central Bank of Aruba and served as its founding president. In Aruba, he also served as the president of the Aruban Investment Bank. For the second time in 2007 to 2008, he served as the president of the Central Bank of Aruba. Mr. Mehran retired from the IMF in 2003. In addition to a number of articles, he's the author and editor of Monetary Exchange Reform in China, 1969, External Debt Management, published in 1985, and Interest Rate Liberalization and Money Market Development, published in 1966 the signed copies of his newly published book, The Goals and Policies of the Central Bank of Iran, are available right outside. To add a few personal notes to my, in my formal introduction, I would like to invite his colleague 
an old friend, Mr. Fereydun Zahedi, to say a few personal notes. I would like to also take this opportunity to thank Mr. Zahedi for his continued support of Iranian studies at the University of Toronto. Thank you, Mr. Zahedi. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, in many countries around the world, there are individuals whose uh, contribution, valuable contribution to their society and country has made a difference and has left a legacy behind. Hassan Ali Mehran is one of them. I've known Mr. Mehran for over 57 years. And I have witnessed his progress into key posts, an important role he played in the development of the rapidly economy of Iran in the 1960s and 1970s. As a governor general, I was a governor of the Central Bank of Iran, he was amongst those who uh, introduced uh, and implemented a sound monetary policy in the banking industry in Iran. His valuable contribution as uh, Minister of Finance, Ministry of Economy, and uh, Managing Director of National Iranian Oil Company was, uh, which was one of the most important institutions in Iran, was amongst his outstanding uh, achievements. He also made significant con contribution worldwide as a senior member of the International Monetary Fund. I found uh, his book which Mohammed has in here. I found his book very, very, uh, very uh, instructive and educational and uh, contains uh, good uh, uh, and contains uh, good analysis of the banking system in Iran. Uh, I would like to thank Mohammad for uh, inviting this distinguished personality to the University of Toronto. And on personal note, I'd like to thank him and acknowledge on behalf of many Iranians for his service to Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, one and the only one, Hassan Ali Mehran. I would like to invite you to. Uh, is, we'll have just a few notes by the chair of the. Oh, party. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a real privilege to have Dr. Madron give the lecture this evening and to have him visit us here at the U of T. And so I, on behalf of the Department of Near Middle Eastern Civilizations and the Faculty of Arts and Science, U of T, we're really pleased that you have made this trek up into the wilderness, cold weather, and all of the rest that you've had to cross in terms of getting yourself to Toronto. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to hearing your talk uh, this evening. And I think that if I can just read the title in case there, uh, anyone hasn't heard it, the, the talk this evening is going to be on the goals and policies of the Central Bank of Iran between 1960 and 1978. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Professor Tavakuri Tari, for inviting me to join this distinguished institution for at least one evening. I also like to thank the Foundation for Iranian Studies for their support and all my friends who are here who've been very encouraging to me to be with you tonight. But I also like to share with you, if I may, we were trying to uh, find out the economic reasons for the revolution in Iran. That was the topic of the seminar. And over a three-hour period, 
having covered a number of written work on the subject, we came to the conclusion that perhaps economic issues were not necessarily the full story behind the revolution of Iran, even though they might have had something to do with it. I tried to make a case that the Central Bank of Iran certainly had nothing to do with it. <laughs> even though it was not very convincing. But there were a number of topics I think are worth recalling again tonight. That is that during the period under our discussion, that is 1960 to 78, a number of developments had happened in Iran. Subsequent to that, since the revolution, also many developments have taken place on the economic side of the country where one begins to look for certain continuity and certain contrast. Clearly the revolution in 1979 was a major disruption or at least departure from the previous practices. But eventually, if you look at some of the live discussions in Iran today about economic policies, they begin to be very familiar in one's ears, including, for example, a statement by the Minister of Economic Affairs and Finance in the new administration of Iran when he was trying to explain some of the problems which had arisen out of the economic policies followed in the previous administration, he made the point that it was not the first time that we have made these mistakes. And then he referred to the time of the Shah, where in fact he felt that the same policies as Mr. Ahmadinejad um, had been followed. And what were those policies and what are those continuing elements in the Iranian economy which seems to serve as the underpinning of some of the problems that we may face or some of the successes we might have experienced. I made a case, or at least I reminded my audience last night, and I'd like to summarize it today and tonight. That is that when you look at the history of Iran, history of modern Iran, and the books written about it, Often you go back to 1906, which is the start, of course, of the Constitutional Revolution of Iran. And we also have a number of other major markers in our history. The best example, of course, is the most recent one of February 11, 1979, the day of the revolution. But we also have August 19th, Istash to Mordad. We have the time of the uh, coming to power of Reza Shah and a number of other markers. There is one date in Iranian history that often we don't know about, or certainly it's not part of our consciousness. It happens to be May 26, 1908. And it didn't happen in Tehran as often most events happen in Iran. It happened in Masjid Suleiman in Khuzestan. It was 116 degrees Fahrenheit, nothing like Toronto. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. And it was when oil, for the first time, erupted at the height of about 1,000 feet, as observed by uh, Mr. Wilson, who was then commanding an Indian uh, army who were to protect the uh, workers um, uh, who were uh, exploiting oil at the time. It says a little bit about Iran of that day, but it also marks a day that Iran never was the same again. To understand monetary policy in Iran, to understand the economic policies of Iran, to understand the blessings and the curse of oil income, is synonymous. What is it about oil which is so special? On the political side, it's worth remembering that it was a concession given to foreigners. It was a concession given to foreigners who were totally autonomous 
in exploiting those resources under their concession. The word itself, concession, is politically loaded. You're con extending a concession to a foreigner to exploit in exchange for a highly capital intensive uh, industry which you continue to depend on foreigners for supply of technology, for markets, and for machinery. The other aspect of oil is that ultimately, certainly in my time, the production cost related to the selling price of oil is totally disproportionate. At a time that when we were selling it for $12, it was probably about 15 or 20 cents. This enormous difference explains why, in terms of oil production, there is no countervailing activity in line with that amount of income inside the economy. As such, therefore, it becomes basically a kind of a wealth that you would then distribute. And the emphasis is on distribution. Therefore, given the fact that the government is the main owner of the resource, so what happens is that how does the government distribute oil income? In terms of economic jargon, what we are really talking about is that what matters most in a developing country, especially in a highly populated country, is fiscal policy. It's what happens to the oil money, how is it spent by the government. Once you make a decision about that, once you make a decision about the way in which the budget is to be distributed within the country, you are then talking about what happens to the economy. And the difference or the similarity between the administration of Mr. Ahmadinejad, at least in the words of this observer, and the show was that they were also trying to put the oil money on the tables of each Iranian. What happens to the monetary policy in this context, therefore, is a matter of an enormous amount of liquidity that is generated inside the economy and which eventually leads to inflation. Why does it lead to inflation? As we discussed it last night, it's primarily because the amount of resources that you put in the country it has to be in line with the absorptive capacity of that country. When you are a highly populated economy, like in Iran, there is a lot of demand on the oil money. There are always demands for extra schools, for extra hospitals, for extra roads, for extra uh, ports, and many other facilities. In order to meet all that, quickly and earnestly, you then expand your budget enormously in line with the oil income in order to meet all those demands which are put on the budget. And given the limit that the economy can absorb, you begin to have immediate bottlenecks in the process as we experienced in Iran of the 1970s in particular when the price of oil went four times in 1973-74. You may ask, what happens to a country like Norway? You can also have oil money, far in excess of the cost of producing oil. But when you're an industrialized country, there is much less demand on the government. Therefore, you have the luxury of having a sovereign fund investing the oil money abroad 
and spending it domestically as much as you think you can absorb it and you need it domestically. But in an oil producing country which is highly populated and is developing, given all those, resources, all those demands on the budget and the fact that the politicians perhaps cannot say no, you end up with an enormous increase in the budget. Another feature of the oil income is that it's not consistently increasing at a certain determined level or rate. There is volatility in it, as there is volatility in the price of oil. So one year, and it happened exactly in 1974, the budget doubled in Iran. The following year, then the oil price went up only a percentage or two. But now you have this enormous increase. You've started a number of huge projects. And what you have to do now is to sustain that momentum. And interestingly enough, within two to two and a half years, we ended up in a budget deficit situation in Iran, as rich as it was in 1973-74, and much more reliance on the banking system. In the book that uh, Professor Tabakuri referred to, I try to explain the role that the central bank in Iran played during that time. I go back to 1960 in order to give the history of the central bank because it started then. That's also an interesting phase of our life in Iran in that 1960, the establishment of the central bank was at the time of a new uh, stabilization policy with the International Monetary Fund. Why? Because previous, in the previous two or three years, it, starting from 1958, there was an enormous expansion of credit as a result of a revaluation of Rio and establishment of a new bank and the government's policy in order to promote industrialization. It led to a balance of payments crisis and a situation where Iran became completely dependent on foreign borrowing and then could not honor its obligations. Stepped in the IMF and st established the central bank at the same time. There was this enormous stabilization policy, severely cutting imports. And that in itself paved the way for what we call the industrial sub uh, import substitution industrial strategy in Iran in 1960 and 61, 62. By curtailing imports, it gave the, it gave the stimulus for Iran to begin to industrialize itself. There was a major recession at the same time. We survived all that. And then that paved the way for a sustained growth in our economy starting in 1962. That, in all the literature, is alluded to the golden economic period in Iran's history. We had 10% real growth per year. We had 1.5% inflation. And we had balance of payments equilibrium. The key to it all, I go back to my old story, economic development, as Dr. Amuzagar called it, on oily legs. Because oil income was increasing gradually, in my view, in line with capacity of the economy to absorb it. When you look at the figures, you'll find, in fact, our income from oil was about maybe $500 million in the mid-60s, and then it began to go took about four years to reach one billion. During that period, we had low inflation. We had industrialization policies taking off. We had also real growth of non-oil GDP. And there came 1973. There came the jumping of the oil price four times to $12. 
And I explained to you from then on, we began to jump in our national income, if you like, but not gross domestic product, some 40% increase in our uh, national income. But eventually it ended up to be negative. Inflation went up to 25% in 1976, if I'm not mistaken. And then we also eventually ended up with a balance of payment situation because the oil income had tripped. If I am correct in what I say to you, that it is fiscal policy that matters most in a developing oil producing country, then you may ask what role is left for the central bank and monetary policy. My immediate reaction is to say not very much. But if you have a chance to read Persian and to read the book, I will try to explain and say something more than just on the economic side. I try to explain why does the central bank matter? And why was the central bank of Iran in the 60s and the 70s was a model institution? At the time of Iran's economic management, we had two new and very powerful, in my view, government institutions, the plan organization and the central bank. We also had, of course, the Ministry of Economy, which was the coordinator of our economic policy, especially with industrial development. But primarily, these two institutions were in charge of the coordination and the budget, as well as the monetary policy. The special sides of the central bank, um, which are worth remembering, is that being a new institution, having been catered, uh, being uh, uh, carved out of the National Bank of Iran, which was a commercial bank, it had to relate to the rest of the world. That in itself gave it an impetus to be to stay in touch with and stay current on the critical issues of the time. One, at the time, of course, we had only telex. There were no emails or faxes. But if you have dealing with foreign correspondents and they're on the telex machine waiting for your answer, you cannot sit on it. You have to act on it. The second part of the central bank was that because of it, perhaps partly, you spend a lot of time and energy on training people, institutions. By the time that I went to the central bank in 1975, a tradition had already been established on how to do things professionally and how to be faithful to the mission of the bank. And here is another story that I'm trying to tell in this book, and that is that when you read about Iran, the causes of revolution, or you try to summarize the time and the political system of the 60s and 70s, you often find, and I'm sorry to say it's also true of those scholars in the universities who write about it, we have always a tendency to summarize and to shorten in order to explain things. So we refer to that time, the time of dictatorship, government by fiat, arbitrary rule, there are many expressions of political scientists who try to describe the political system in Iran. In this book, I have tried to explain that even in the dictatorship, there are institutions, not only they matter, but they also act according to what was the law of the time. They were also served by some of the finest civil servants that Iran had ever produced not only at the high level of governor or deputy governor or members of the board, but also at the staff level, which was critical. And I witnessed it, I inherited it. I noticed how much my predecessors had contributed to the establishment of that bank and the manner in which things are done. I noticed it that the entire system was built 
to protect the bank against maybe governors like myself, a newcomer who doesn't know what central bank is all about. And what we opened before ourselves, before we could clarify whether it's the right thing to do or not, was not the command of His Majesty, although we did have a number of them coming our ways. It was the law of the land, the 1351 central banking law in Iran. And the provisions of that, which defined the mission of the central bank. But in what manner would that central bank be different from today's, let's say, Federal Reserve System in the United States or Bank of Canada? Times, of course, have changed. But the realities of our situation was also quite different. I alluded to the fact that the central bank was born in a recession. That explains a lot about the manner in which the central bank went about doing its business. It was not low inflation or zero inflation at all costs. It was part of the development process that what do we do as part of our mission to contribute to the development of the country. And in the 60s, the central bank was operating at a time that inflation was not a problem. So not being an issue, therefore, you joined forces with the plan organization, with the Ministry of Economy, to know what is the right thing to do to, in a coordinated fashion, so that the monetary policy will be complementary to our industrial policy, to our planning policy, to our overall development strategy. That development and growth strategy remain in the pinnacle of the operations of the central bank. Naturally, in the Federal Reserve System of the United States and Bank of Canada, you're also very much concerned about unemployment, you're concerned about recession, you take measures in order to come out of the recession. But these are unusual times, the unusual times of a recession in an economy that you then gear your monetary policy, when in fact you're concerned about falling prices, to harness all the resources of the country in order to generate more employment, meaningful employment. In Iran, you have a different point of view, namely development. What do we do to ensure the development of the economy as a whole? Well, at the time of institution building in Iran, there was very much emphasis on when we are to industrialize, therefore, let's give the industrialists the new tools and some of them, in fact, had a commercial or a merchant background and were not quite masters of new industries and how to go about them. Our answer in Iran was finding specialized banks, especially IMDBI, in which that my dear friend, Mr. Zaidi, was a member of on the staff. And with the support of the World Bank and international banking institutions, the idea was that we bring expertise in project evaluation and also at an interest rate which will be conducive and encouraging to the industrialists to do their business. These banks were also under the supervision, of course, of the central bank. But given that they had a development mission, they were always treated rather special in that they were doing part of the overall economic strategy of the country. Meanwhile, of course, the supervisory functions of the central bank remained paramount to the functions and the responsibilities of the management. And in those areas, given especially with the commercial banks, I think the central bank was very much on the top of the situation in terms of securing the soundness of the banking system. How to treat a bank which was non-performing in terms of assets, 
and how to correct the various measures. Of course, it was not perfect, but it was quite dominant. As a, rela as a related idea, two things I'd like to elaborate was about our foreign exchange policy and about our interest rate policy. What happens in a situation like that? If you look at the interest rates prevailing at the time in the 70s in Iran, when in fact we had gone into a high inflationary situation, you may find that real interest rates, as we define them in economics, were not paramount in the economy. They were perhaps negative. But that was a time that when we had a fairly inflationary environment worldwide, if you look at the inflation rates in the industrialized countries, they were quite in their two-digit figures. You may remember in the 70s. That was partly because or at least was the basis for the Shah and other members of the OPEC to use that as a basis to increase the price of oil. In a situation like that, even during my time, we used interest rates indicatively. You would find, in fact, that there are increases in interest rates in the 70s going up to 12% to 14%, which was fairly large in our country. But we allowed usually what we call the permissible. That means the banks were allowed their own discretion so long as they did not exceed those indicators. The case of exchange rate is something which again you find in Iran today. We kept it stable with one change in 1968 as a result of the, as you know, the dollar was uh, taken off uh, the gold standard and the Nixon era and all the periods in which that there was a uh, much greater move to flexibility. We had a revaluation of uh, about 9% and then we stayed at 70 rials per dollar. In a situation where of course we had a huge surplus in our balance of payments. And then inflation began to pick up. It went up, as I mentioned to you, I think, to 25%. We kept the interest rates the same. Meanwhile, as a result of a change in the environment worldwide, we had liberalized our capital accounts. That means Iranians were allowed to export as much as they wanted to in foreign exchange and to import. We had produced two separate uh, markets in Iran, what we call commercial and non-commercial. The idea initially, at least on paper, was to differentiate between the two in terms of prices. But in practice, it turned out that you cannot have a dual exchange rate. It has to be one. Therefore, the central bank became the main supplier to the non-commercial side, which was not the original idea. And the rates remained the same. Interestingly enough, of course, at the much bigger dimensions today, the same debate takes place in Iran. They, have, they are facing different uh, policy options, but nonetheless, whether to move the exchange rate in line with the differential in the consumer price index domestically and the prices of the exporting countries that are dealing with Iran, the, i.e. the industrialized countries, becomes a dominant feature of the economy. If you look what happened in Iran, they've had a number of shocks into the system with enormous changes. At the moment, it's about 2,950 2 toman, that is 29,000 rials, to a dollar. And there again, within a year, it is now out of line with the rest of the world in terms of purchasing power. And the dilemma remains, even though Iran had earned some $700 billion worth of foreign exchange during the eight years of the administration of Mr. Ahmadinejad from 2005 to 2012, the idea of keeping the, uh, the exchange rate stable, that is highly overvalued, in our terminology, in order to fight inflation. In fact, what you, because you want to keep prices down. Whereas, in fact, this way you're feeding 
into the fire. You are not fighting inflation on the country, you are encouraging more imports at much cheaper prices, at the expense of domestic production. And this is the dilemma they have in Iran today. One way of, of course, doing it is to try to bring the inflation down, which they are doing so. But meanwhile, the budget continues to be out of line, and the budget continues to be inflationary per se, creating a fair amount of uh, monetary base for expansion uh, of credit. One other feature that I like to touch on, and again compare the two, is the concept of independence of the central bank. I address it in the book, and I try to elaborate it today because it's also part of parliamentary debate in Iran today. How independent should the central bank be? in conducting exchange rate policies, in conducting monetary policy, and in supporting the government's uh, economic development, how independent should it be? When you raise that question, you should always have a supplementary, namely that independent of whom and by whom. In case of a central bank, when you're also basically the government's commercial bank, you ask yourself that, who is your main client? Like any commercial bank, I think you have to take note of who is your main client. In case of a central bank in Iran, it is the government. More importantly, the government is also your sole shareholder. So they sit there at the end of the year, look at your accounts. In today's Iran, the President of the Republic is the Chairman of the General Council, at the General uh, Assembly of the Central Bank, i.e. the shareholders meeting. So the President himself sits together with four ministers to look at the accounts of the Central Bank. In my, at my time, it was the Minister of Economic Affairs and Finance who chaired that meeting. The composition of the Monetary Council which is in charge of monetary policy, again becomes a matter of how in, uh, independent can a central bank be in its operations. It is extremely difficult to be able to be independent, in the, again in the tradition of the Federal Reserve in the United States or Bank of Canada, when your shareholder and your main client are both the same, represented by the same man, i.e. the Minister of Economic Affairs and Finance, or sometimes even the President of the Republic. It's very difficult to ignore that call when it comes through, as if you're sitting at the central bank as a governor. And more importantly, you find that in a developing country, again like Iran, as like many others, Development, as I mentioned to you, is a prevailing goal. Therefore, any central banker has many functions to perform. It is not just a single purpose of stabilizing prices, which is the main goal of the central bank. Even in the law itself, it says, perform these functions provided that, and in service of, and in order to help the development of the country, which remains the primary goal. With those in mind, the idea that the central bank can fight inflation at all costs is really extremely academic. And the purpose of this book, at least I have said, is to try to explain the, um, the, the way in which we performed our functions at that time. And the idea, and I finish on this score, the idea of this book came to me because uh, in many of the conferences that I had the privilege of attending, I noticed there were a number of people who came from Iran. 
And they came from universities in Iran. And sometimes, on some of these conferences, I had a small panel talking about what I just talked to you about today. What happened in Iran of the 60s and the 70s. Suddenly, I found myself around me, after the conference, a fair degree of enthusiasm and interest in those who had come from Iran about what I had said. Because they said, you know, nobody has ever taught us that. Nobody had actually touched on these times in Iran, if only of us, historic interest. And I thought, well, maybe there's a story here to tell. And that's why it's written in Persian, addressed ultimately to those in Iran, especially those who are students of history, who would like to read it. But as I see and I get more encouraged when I read the daily papers in Iran, that there is now an audience, at least very politely under the title economic history, they refer to the Shah, his time, including the central bank and what happened then, or the plan organization. The stories of the 60s and the 70s, for the first time, is becoming a matter of public debate and even a matter of public comparison. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mehran, for your exceptional talk. Uh, last night, uh, we had the privilege of having him in our uh, seminar on the Iranian Revolution and the exchange and discussion that we had in the class on the role of economy on the making of the revolution was really so heated, productive, that we have decided to be filmed it, and we hope to be, be able to make it available for uh, uh, public, public use sometime soon, along with the film tonight. Due to some um, uh, constraints, uh, we can only entertain one or two questions. If you have burning questions that you must ask, please go ahead. <coughs> Yes, please. Um, I, I actually worked on Central Bank in Lebanon at the same time period. And the birth of the Central Bank in Lebanon, I'm quite interested. And I have two quick uh, questions. Um, one may not be directly related to the role of the Central Bank, but you touched upon the idea of fiscal policy. Um, how do you evaluate the uh, military spending that happened at the time? And uh, I thought that was a major role in the region of the 70s in terms of how people perceived uh, what the Shah's policy was towards development. So, economically speaking, what does military spending do? do? And also from a, a development political point of view, uh, especially if we look at current uh, countries in uh, the Gulf that also seem to be recycling a lot of this money back into, a, you know, perhaps at least in Iran it was uh, much more technologically uh, used than in the Gulf. And the second question is I was, I was surprised to learn, unfortunately I don't speak uh, Farsi, so I won't be able to read your book, and I have to get my dissertation done soon, so I'm not sure what to do. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask you, uh, I hope you do translate it either way. Um, you have Persian classes someone, that you can take. How, <laughs> how come, I'm, I'm curious to know why um, in Lebanon, it happened in 1964, 20 years after uh, formal political independence, <laughs> but countries like Syria set it up in like 1953. So uh, you know, given the strength of Iran, so how come it took so long to set up a set up? Does that also an indication of the lack of some form of uh, sovereignty or dependence and kind of a complete uh, dependence on the IMF and the world uh, policy? Thank you so much. Let me answer your second question first because it's easier for me to answer that. The, the central bank in Iran started in 1304 Iranian calendar and 1307 when the National Bank of Iran was instigated under Reza Shah. That was our first central bank which also had full commercial operations. That's in 1928. That's right. And then the central bank per se was carved out of that national bank in 1960. So our central banking goes back to that time. A little bit of history for you again, which you will find when I talk about that concession, Banki Shah and Shah Iran, which again was a concession to a foreign power, had the, uh, the right to issue notes in Iran as a central bank, but it was wholly foreign owned. One of the aspirations, of national aspirations of Iran, 
given that background, was always to have Bank Milli Khodeman, our own national bank. And Bank Milli was the answer to that with the help of some technical support from Germany. It was set up in Iran. So central banking does go back, but combined with commercial banking, many years uh, before I mentioned that to you. On the second, uh, on your first question, yes, military expenditure was a major component of the budget. I think in the words of the Shah, at least those which are quoted by him, uh, by others, uh, that he felt that development without security didn't mean much. His emphasis on security, or at least from his perspective, uh, was that in order to be independent of foreigners in the region, one has to be able to provide the amount, the type of security that they expect to provide themselves autonomously, and for a time, you have to be dependent on them. You're quite right, the economic consequences of it were staggering, but more importantly, in my view, politically and psychologically, this dependence on foreign technology and very sophisticated weapons brought a physical presence of a number of advisors, not just handful, I'm talking about 50,000, at least this is the reported figure from the United States alone, they were highly localized in some of the provinces in Iran. And their physical presence, uh, I thought, uh, at least many observers felt, were very critical to the perception of the Shah as uh, someone that who is so dependent on them, whereas in fact his perspective and his mindset was quite different. He felt this was a way of becoming independent of them, if only he had time on his side. Thank you much. Please, Mr. Tabith. Sir, he asked a question coming to the today issue, which is, in my mind is a, something I couldn't digest as a, that's why, you know, uh, as a monetary expert, uh, was there any measure possible to be taken when they implemented the sanction in Iran so that today Iranian people knows where are the money during the last three, four years for $500 million disappeared? You're asking me. As a monetary expert, yeah. was there any way to be, to be in coordinated measures to control that? Problem? One of, I can only speculate, if I may, and I ventured well outside my competence, but from what I read, and I read as much as, you know, perhaps some of you, um, it partly the recent uh, uh, crisis in this, and I call it crisis, uh, which has been experienced in Iran, is partly as a result of sanctions. The US sanctions in particular, I think, has forced Iran government, as I understand it, to circumvent the sanctions by going through individuals to do certain things. If the National Iranian Oil Company or the Ministry of Oil cannot sell oil, you give it to a particular individual, as they call it, Khodi, maybe an insider, and then he is supposed to sell it under his name or a corporation thereof. And he now has to credit the government as an individual. A second problem arises there, which again requires another intermediary, namely that money cannot be transferred from overseas, from the buyer, to the, because all the banks, again, are subject to sanctions. So what do they do? As I read in the paper recently, in Turkey, you bring gold from Ghana in exchange for the oil you have sold to someone else. Now, with all these intermediaries, none are channeled through the official system. And how to supervise that? I mean, you don't need to be a monetary expert. Any expertise that one develops as a central banker is based on a regulated, authorized financial institution which operates under a license and under the law. Whatever I just described to is outside the law. So that's what happens. They get lost. Billions of dollars might have got lost as a result of that.
Well, thank you all for uh, participating, and uh, please join me if you thank Mr. Mehran for his excellent work.